So welcome uh, to the first of our new and occasional series, In the Dock. Uh, my name is Lawrence Lessig. I'm the director of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics and a professor here at the law school. And as I described this series when we announced it, our aim is to have a conversation with a wider range of souls than is typically on this stage. Um, these are people with a different kind of experience, sometimes illegal experience, sometimes ethical experience. But of course, for such a conversation to make sense, these are also souls who have demonstrated a certain reflection, a certain ability to reflect upon what they know and what they've experienced in a way that would contribute to the, uh, to the work of this center. Um, and so that plus the willingness to engage in a conversation that might advance our understanding of the ethical issues that are at the heart of our work. And so I'm extremely grateful tonight uh, to Jack Abramoff that he has helped us launch this series, perhaps the perfect launch for this series. Um, as everyone here knows, Jack Abramoff is America's most famous, perhaps infamous lobbyist. Um, in January 2006, he pled guilty to three federal criminal uh, felony counts involving his work as a lobbyist. In the same month, he pled guilty to two felony criminal counts in Miami related to a casino venture. Two years later, he was found guilty of exchanging gifts for favors. He was sentenced to up to 11 years um, uh, for the full range of these counts that he pled or was convicted of. In June last year, he was transferred from a federal correctional institution to a halfway house in Baltimore. Uh, and a year ago, he was released on probation and now lives under the constant surveillance of our criminal system with a continuing obligation to pay whatever money he earns in restitution back uh, to the government. Um, now, Jack's story has been told in the press and in the movies, um, including a documentary by Alex Gibney and a feature film star of it starring Kevin Spacey. It must have been very cool to meet Kevin Spacey. Um, <laughs> Um, and so it's been told again and again and is quite familiar to everybody. And if you're a junkie for this sort of stuff as I am, after you read his extremely compelling account in his book, Capital Punishment, which I think we have available downstairs, um, I think you'll experience a little bit of a Rashomon effect as you try to piece together exactly who did what when. Um, but the conversation we're going to have tonight uh, has nothing to do with that story. Uh, or those stories. We're not here to relitigate the guilt or innocence of a lobbyist. Um, we're here tonight to learn about the institution that he lobbied, Congress, and about the nature of the political system that he so successfully navigated. And it was my sense before I read the book and my conviction after I read his book that his experience has an enormous amount to teach us. And my aim in this conversation tonight is to walk through the aspects of that experience that might in fact inform. And so if we're successful, it will be in large part because we've had the chance to engage with a man who has had an extraordinary and diverse life. He's a committed and practicing Orthodox Jew who has made religion a central part and a con central constraint on his life. There's a wonderful story in the book of him being summoned by Imelda Marcos to come meet Imelda Marcos, and she suggested 12 o'clock on Friday, and it turned out that was midnight on Friday, which of course meant he wasn't able to drive to the meeting, so he had to walk through Phil the Philippines to the meeting space, which of course, if you've been to the Philippines um, late at night, this is not necessarily the best thing for um, a non-native to engage in, but this was the only way he could go through with a meeting that was to be held at fr uh, midnight on Friday night. Uh, he was one of the key figures who revived the Republican Party in the early 1980s after graduating from Brandeis. No, one didn't think there were Republicans in Brandeis, but there were. Um, in 1981, he became chairman of the College Republicans. Um, at the very same time, um, I was the chairman of the Teenage Republicans of Pennsylvania, so I feel a certain kinship in a weird way uh, here. Um, he has been a film producer. He has been a restaurant owner, a philanthropist. Indeed, um, uh, some report giving up to 80% of his income to uh, various philanthropic uh, causes. Uh, indeed, and maybe the best summary of his character was his own, I think, hilarious summary of himself when he said, quote, I was the power-lifting, football-playing, Orthodox Jewish, right-wing Republican opera buff. You know the type. 
So it's not easy to stand in the dock. There are not many who would do so voluntarily. But again, I am grateful to Jack that he would fling himself to Boston to engage in this conversation to help all of us understand a bit more a system that practically none of us respect. So Jack, thank you and welcome here tonight. So I want to begin the conversation by trying to get our bearings. And I was struck early in the book with um, two stories you tell, uh, one which outraged you and the other which you passed over without really recognizing any problem. Um, so the first one that outraged you was a story about uh, getting uh, Reagan trying to get his MX missile passed. Um, and it's a story of you getting a telephone call from Congressman Bustamante, congressman from, tennis, uh, from Texas. Uh, and as you recount in the book, you say, yes, sir, what can I do for you? And Bustamante says, the Defense Department is planning to place a new naval base in the Gulf of Mexico, and I want it for my district. I hear they are looking, for Florida, looking at Florida instead. If I get the base, you get the votes. If I don't, you don't get the votes. The votes are from my Hispanic caucus, and they are solidly in my control. What do you say? And you remark, this is your first moment, your first experience of true Washington corruption. That's it. Um, uh, and Bustamante, of course, later is convicted of various felonies and is sent to prison. So it's not implausible to say that corruption was in at least part of his soul. OK. But I want you to put that story next to another story, which you tell um, early in the book, about the great Richard Gordon, who taught entertainment law at uh, at uh, Georgetown, um, and he was great. I mean, he was an extraordinary professor. But you tell the story about trying to get into his entertainment law class. And you say, I called him daily for a week. I plied him with offers to meet the nation's leading conservatives. I invited him to the opera. I got my friend Ben Waldman, who worked for the Reagan administration and had dining privileges at the West Wing, to get him an invitation to eat there daily. Fortunately, my full press was effective, and I got my spot in the seminar. Now this is unremarked in the story. It's just a happy story about you getting into a kind of class. And I found myself kind of struck that the thing you found corrupt, Bustamante, I was not quite sure of. I mean, here was a congressman working, not giving anybody any money, he wasn't doing anything. He was just saying, here's the deal. I'm going to vote for you if you do this political thing for my district. And here was Richard Gordon, my hero, Richard Gordon. You're suggesting that he put you in the class because you offered him lunch at the White House. Now, uh, first of all, convince me Richard Gordon didn't give you, get you in the class because of that. But explain to me why the Richard Gordon thing is unproblematic, if it's in fact true, while the Bustamante thing is deeply troubling, or corruption, as you call it. Well, um, I, I hope there were other reasons he let me in the class. The, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think in the book, I wrote about my uh, efforts to get into a class. And as I look back, and I know there are probably some law students here, to think of uh, lobbying to get into a law class is probably not what uh, everybody would have in mind. But uh, I guess that's what, <laughs> I, was, that's what I was doing. And, and you're right. At a certain level, indeed, it, it is uh, kind of the same problem, uh, where one is bringing extraordinary means and uh, irrelevant uh, benefits to play and to trying to achieve a goal. And uh, I, guess, I guess what happened, I was 22, 23 perhaps, when um, maybe 24, I can't even remember, uh, when I was head of President Reagan's lobby and Congressman Bustamante called me into his office and hit me with this. And I then, as I discussed in the book, I called the White House, was kind of shocked uh, that he would say such a thing, that uh, he would give up seven votes for a naval base. Uh, and uh, I guess I, I was uh, naive. Uh, and the folks at the White House probably thought I was silly uh, calling and even asking that question. And of course, they approved it. And, the, and Reagan got the MX missile. That's how that vote got through the Congress. And so on the, on the one hand, that was obviously corrupt to me. Uh, yet on the other hand, I kind of blithely went about doing similar things. Probably the distinction I would make in my mind then, and maybe now to some degree, but certainly then, uh, is that uh, as I look back on it, as I look back on it, because certainly my whole career became one of using um, my skills, whatever they were, to lobby, to get public servants to give outcomes. Right. Um, and uh, so in this case, he was a public service, public servant, trading 
arguably for the benefit of his district, by the way. And I would probably have, in terms of parsing it, viewed my, uh, uh, I was a private citizen trying to just get ahead. But at the end of the day, I think uh, it is the case that whether one's doing that or one's offering uh, candy to trick kids to come into your store so the parents uh, buy or whatever one's doing, at some level, there's some um, uh, bit of corruption there. And the question, I guess, is we have to confront each of these in our daily interactions and decide what level are we willing to play at. Well, but when you said there was possibly a problem with what Richard Gordon did, you said it was because there was something irrelevant about the gift that was being offered. Um, and I guess... Well, it wasn't related to it the... It wasn't related to the underlying right, issue, right? right? And right. so, but I wonder if that's just not too high a standard to apply in the context of politics. I mean, don't we have to have some politics that we could call non-corrupt? Or is just it impossible to imagine democratic politics except with you calling everything corrupt? Because no, no, I, I don't think everything's corrupt. And okay. I don't think all lobbying's corrupt, by the way. I think lobbying is a, is a good thing. I think lobbying is a cherished right that we have in the Constitution. We have the right to petition our government or to use agents to petition our government or to band together. And that's something we don't want to lose. And I would say that most lobbyists in Washington even uh, and in the state capitals are probably not doing it corruptly. It's where money gets mixed into the uh, okay, lobbying. Okay, but Bustamante didn't have money on the table. Well, right? in a certain way he did. Uh, in a certain way he did. He because was delivering, was... He was delivering um, uh, jobs. Uh, and I guess what was probably um, uh, unusual for me, let's just say at that point, uh, was here the horse trading of it all just seemed to be so bizarre. We were trying to convince people. My job at that point was to convince members of Congress to vote for um, a program, the MX missile program in this case, because of the merits of it. And I was lobbying on the merits in those days. When I later became a lobbyist, <laughs> I learned that merits are interesting, but they uh, don't usually win. And uh, unfortunately, um, and, uh, but in those days it was merits. And here was somebody for the first time in my life who um, said that he would give an outcome that I desired for something that had nothing to do with the merits of, of the MX missile in, mm -hmm. the, in that case. Okay, so but we, we can certainly agree that when the irrelevant issue is money, campaign contributions, or cash in your pocket, both of those, I think both of us think, raise troubling problems inside of the system. One striking fact in the book is, uh, you know, I guess when I was looking at this, I was much more charitable in my interpretation of what must be going on inside the system. Y your account of the role of money here is not charitable at all. Um, you insist, um, well, first of all, you insist that it's natural that people inside the system, the lobbyists in particular, would expect that they need to be rewarding their benefactors with contributions. Um, I, and, uh, uh, and you say there's no question that these contributions have a significant impact on this process and the impact is not positive. I can tell you we have a department here at Harvard that would question that, but okay, I think you might have an insight stronger than the department with their statisticians. Um, uh, and you said, um, uh, uh, you say, quote, that contributions from parties with an interest in legislation are really nothing but bribes. Um, nothing but bribes inside of the system. Even though these are not for personal gain, they're just for political gain. Um, uh, and most striking to me was the way in which you laid out how the, feels like extortion gets played. You tell this extraordinary story of Tom DeLay meeting with the Microsoft representatives. Uh, and um, suggesting that they needed to help out with the Republicans to keep the Republicans in power because the Republicans were more la na naturally aligned to Microsoft's interests. And then DeLay says, you know, when he was a uh, um, uh, freshman, he says, he, you say, he told them about approaching Walmart for contributions. And uh, then you quote from you, so the government affairs Depart director of Walmart told him that Walmart didn't like to sully their hands with political involvement. And then DeLay, staring intently at the Microsoft executives, continued, quote, a year later, that government affairs rep was in my office asking me to intervene to get an exit bill from the federal highway to a new Walmart store. I told him I didn't want to sully my hands with such a task. You know what? They didn't get their ramp. And you know what else? They never will get their ramp. 
And then DeLay smiled without taking his eyes off the quivering executives from Microsoft. Kind of hard to imagine quivering executives from Microsoft, but there they were. <laughs> and as we would often say in the lobbying business, they finally got the joke, and a $100,000 check was soon thereafter delivered to the Republican Congressional Committee. Now, from my view, that's extortion, right? That's sending a clear message that you play along or you're not going to get what you need. Um, and you characterize this as just as commonplace as anything inside the system. Well, unfortunately, delay wasn't the only one I witnessed doing stuff like that. Um, most members of Congress are very subtle. Um, when you're, uh, I, I, by the way, I didn't need to get these speeches from them because I got the joke myself. Yeah. You know, when I was lobbying, I was doing everything I could to raise money for everybody I could. I had 40 people working for me, and we raised millions of dollars. But other lobbyists sometimes are a little more obtuse and they, uh, they need to be reminded. And so these members of Congress, what they'll do, sta the standard procedure will be, they'll work with you on an issue, they'll agree to support your bill or oppose whatever you want to oppose. And they'll say, you know, by the way, I'm having a fundraiser next Tuesday. I don't know if you got the invitation to that or not. Which means uh, you better come up with some money. If you want me to keep doing this, you better come up with some money. Now delay, was known as the hammer, yeah. okay? And so delay didn't mince words sometimes. Even that was a little subtle for delay. Um, but uh, delay, and, and he wasn't alone. Uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, who's the delegate for Washington, D.C., was caught infamously on tape actually uh, calling a lobbyist just last year, I think it was, saying that, uh, I, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a uh, chairperson of this committee, and I understand you're coming to our committee for the results, and I can't believe I looked at my fundraising list. You're not on the list. Is something wrong with you? Why are you not giving me money? So yeah. sometimes it's subtle, and sometimes it's very much uh, out front. It's certainly extortion, and it's, it, they're soliciting bribes, in essence, is what they're doing. Yeah. And, um, and, but it's, it's, unfortunately, it's spread throughout the system, whether they're subtle or not. Now, is it your perception that it was always like that, or it grew during a certain period? Is it any, do you have a sense, I mean, you wouldn't have experience, but do you right. have a sense that it's different? Is, I, I think it was less subtle, frankly, years ago. But it's from the stories I, you know, I, I uh, when I first started my political career, I knew lobbyists who were senior at that point and were active in the 60s and the 50s. And they said it was less, less subtle. When LBJ would call you in, there wouldn't be any niceties. So where's your hundred thousand know, dollars? there'd be members of Congress who said, "You want to sit down with me? Come up. Where's the cash?" It wasn't checks, by the way. It wasn't, uh, you know, uh, fifty, two thousand dollars checks. It was a hundred thousand dollars in cash. Where's your money? So, and, and on the one hand, it was uh, it was more disgusting, <laughs> more openly uh, mm -hmm. outrageous. Uh, and I think today, um, one of the ways that members of Congress get around uh, feeling horrible about themselves is their subtlety, is their dissimulation, is trying to make it out to be something other than what it is. Gee, by the way, I'm having a fundraiser next Tuesday night, just in case you happen to be in the room with extra money falling out of your pocket, yeah. uh, I'm yeah. having a fundraiser. Yeah. They mean the same thing. Okay, so they're, le they're more subtle. That might make it easier to feel good about themselves. But you also point to them asking for money for things that don't directly benefit them. So for example, $25,000 for their charity or $50,000 for the Congressional Campaign Committee. Is it your perception that the shift is away from the kind of Blagojevich or the, uh, or the Randy Duke Cunningham type of corruption, which is, you know, what are you gonna do for my checking account, personal checking account, and more towards how do we exercise influence for these things that indirectly benefit me but aren't really about me getting uh, a boat? Well, no, because, you know, the thing is, Randy Cunningham and Blagojevich and William Jefferson and people like that who are, Bob May even, who've got their hand out and want you to actually put cash in there or will give you a menu like Randy Cunningham, yeah. Duke Cunningham, but you know, if you want to have an appetizer, that's going to be two thousand dollars, a hundred thousand. This, that kind of stuff is rare. But the fact is, these members are not asking for contributions to something they're disinterested in. If it's a charity, oftentimes these charity will pay for their travel, or these charities will hire their wives or their, or their ki children. If they're asking for money for the Republican or Democratic Congressional Committee, it's because they've been given a requirement by those committees just to raise a certain amount of money so they get their chairmanships. There's no, very few are altruistically raising money for you know, yeah. the uh, goodwill industries. 
right. out there. They're, they're raising money for things that they are involved in. So it's not directly into their bank account, but it might as well be, really. Right, okay. And then, and then another dimension of this story that you tell, which is really rich and interesting, is that uh, money, of course, is just one technique that the lobbyists can deploy. Uh, money gifts become another aspect of this kind of money. Um, but, you know, terrifying things to read about, for example, you describe how lobbyists with great influence and certain representatives can actually cause the advent of congressional hearing and to do so utterly destroy whomever their client wishes to destroy because the cost of preparing for a hearing could be up to a million dollars for this kind of hearing. So these, this, is a, this is a kind of weapon that you get to deploy in a way to guarantee that people line up in the way that you want them to line up. Yeah, I think most people probably don't think about the fact that the government has become a weapon for people. Uh, and it's not merely a weapon to go fight wars. It's a weapon to fight wars at home. And lobbyists, and frankly, this was, I'm, I'm ashamed to tell you that this was the kind of lobbyist I was. Um, I knew what the, what the deal was. If, a, if somebody's called up for a hearing, I'll just give you an idea what a hearing is in the, in the Senate or in the House. People think House and Senate hearings are like trials, and you get a lawyer, and you go up there, and you get a fair hearing, and everything is hunky-dory. It's not. Hearings are kangaroo courts in Congress. Most hearings are designed to achieve a goal that's not ever expressed. And in, in, the, in the sense that lobbyists would uh, push a hearing, uh, it would be for the purpose of putting your opponent, whoever that might be, on defense and setting them back. To prepare properly for a congressional hearing, a hearing that could theoretically land you in prison, by the way, if you perjure yourself, or even if they decide to hold you in contempt of their body, of the House or the Senate could actually get you, they have a cell, they have a jail cell in the building wow. that they can put you in. And by the way, when I was called up for my hearing, this was very mindful uh, to me that that, that cell was there. Um, so, it, it, and it can, it can destroy your reputation, it can destroy everything you have. But even if it goes well, you're gonna spend a million dollars preparing for your hearing. You're gonna spend weeks and weeks not sleeping preparing for your hearing. You're not gonna do anything that might be a problem, meaning anything your opponents might be able to come after you. So one of the great ways to disable your opponent is to organize a hearing. Unfortunately, it's done all the time. There are, what, 35 uh, standing committees, or I forget what the number was at this point, um, on the Hill, and they're holding hearings every, all the day, every day. And just multiply that out, and you see how the lobbyist is able to play and how the special interests are able to play in a way that most Americans are just totally unaware of what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And the people who, go, who get called to these hearings, I mean, I mean, who pays them to be going to these hearings? Pays them? What well, I mean, mean, even like their expenses. I mean, if like an ordinary person from Boston or California. As a witness for the yeah, committee, you mean? Yeah, somebody who's a tool in the attack? Yeah. Uh, sometimes the committee will pay their expenses to get there, uh -huh. most of the time. Uh -huh. Not if they're a target, though. No. Obviously, if they're not a target, if they're a target. And then the other dimension of like a weapon that you could deploy, you know, we often think that the most important influence is the influence over the member. But you quite strongly signal that the most important influence to establish for a lobbyist is the influence over the staffers. Right. And that if you can signal to the staffer, Jim Cooper, a Democrat from Tennessee, uh, described um, Congress as increasingly a farm league for K Street. And he didn't mean just the members, he meant the staffers. Um, and so if you can signal to the staffer that you, know, you might have a future in my very profitable law firm, um, uh, then you've got a very valuable resource. As you put it, quote, his paycheck may have been signed by Congress, but he was already working for me, influencing his office for my client's best interest. It was a perfect and perfectly corrupt arrangement, even though, as you say, no law, no rules had been broken, at least not yet. Um, so is this just a Jack Abramoff innovation, or was this the common pra is this the common practice inside of? Well, I, I didn't innovate anything. I mean, I, I, you know, as I look back on my career uh, you know, of uh, infamy, uh, it would be nice even to say, well, here are the kind of things I, I innovated. I learned everything I I did, I didn't, uh, I don't think I, I may have pushed all of them over the normal boundaries, which is what in part got me in trouble, but uh, there are a lot of smart people in Washington and they think of everything. 
And one of the reasons lobbyists uh, laugh at most of the efforts to reform the system is because they know that no matter what is thrown at them by the people throwing it at them, they're going to overcome it. And so the innovation of staff versus members is one that becomes immediately uh, apparent to you when you're a lobbyist or when you're working with Congress. The truth is um, congressmen used to have no staff. Daniel Webster had no, no staff. You know, the great minds of, of our past, the great leaders of our past, wrote their own bills, wrote their own correspondence, did all their own meetings, uh, and seemed to somehow find time for it. Now, since the federal government is involved in so much and in so many areas of our lives, they have large staffs. And like corporations and like other places, the staff runs the show. And so that becomes apparent to a lobbyist immediately. The ones who are gonna make the decision are gonna give you the access to the staff. So the other thing that you figure out pretty quickly is that most members of Congress are pretty lazy. Uh, they don't wanna do the work. They, they run for office, they love the camera, they love the high, you know, when the click lights go on, they wanna be on TV, they wanna raise money, and they wanna win their elections, but they don't wanna do any work. They certainly don't wanna read the bills, uh, that for certain. Uh, but they don't why? Really... I can't understand why. Yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> busy reading comic books, so they don't uh, have time for the bills. But um, they, they are, they are not, um, they're not really running the trains, the staff is. So when the time came that I started hiring, as I started building my lobbying practice, most people would h try to hire a congressman because of the marquee value of the name and things like that. I had a totally different tack. Uh, I would never hire a congressman. I hired one congressman. I was actually asked by the leadership to hire a nice guy, a bit of adult who couldn't get a job, um, and I hired him, and, but he turned out to be utterly worthless to us. I always hired staff because the staff were hungry and they were killers, and that's the operation I had. Now, what I noticed and what I wrote about in the book is as I started hiring staff, at first I would hire them to come to work immediately because I needed somebody. And so I'd say, come to work tomorrow or come to work next week. But then as I started hiring staff, and I, particularly chiefs of staff, and said, look, when do you want to leave the Hill? Well, I don't want to leave for two years. Okay, in two years I'll hire you. I hired them right then. Mm -hmm. The minute they knew they were coming to work for me, their whole job changed. They were all, and they're, they're human beings. I mean, they, you know, if you have a job and you know you're going somewhere else, you're not going to you know, you're going to at least be thinking about the next job, and you don't want that business to, to go away. So what they do, unfortunately, in one of the real pernicious and corrupt parts of the system, and again, completely legally uh, and, and unknown entirely. I mean, when I tell people this, they look at me and figure, it's obvious when I say it, but until I do, they don't understand it, uh, that the staffer becomes my staffer. So for two years, that staffer is not only my staffer, by the way, not only working like in my office, but is better than my staffer because my staffers can't find the things that person's gonna find uh, and look out for our interests more than our interests, more than we could. And that's what I found was going on. And that's one of the reasons, and we'll get to it, I'm sure, one of the prescriptions right. I have is that those staffers can never become lobbyists. Right, so, but, but if you think about, what's striking about the, problems you describe in the book is that they're completely unrelated, logically at least, to the actual crimes you were convicted of. Um, right. So you're, you're convicted of crimes, um, I mean one of the, I think this is an innovation, you know, you might want to be humble about it, but you, you had an interesting innovation of creating a firm with Mike Scanlon whose job it was to recruit business leaders who might be affected by some particular legislation so that you could produce 5,000 very powerful people overnight who would call a congressperson and say, no, you can't possibly do this. And that, and that was kind of, you know, kind of, it's, it's I said to you, it's a kind of Steve Jobs-ish kind of thing where you look in retrospect and you say, it's kind of obvious, why didn't everybody do this? But nobody was doing it. I mean, this was interesting. Um, but you failed to disclose that you had a financial interest in that firm, and that mm -hmm. was one of the things you were convicted of. You mm -hmm. had tax evasion because you were diverting funds to charities, um, uh, and you had a uh, convict, you had an honest service fraud uh, which I guess there's a question whether after the Supreme Court case how that might play out. But what's striking is none of the problems you're talking about have anything to do with those particular crimes. Right. So if you, you could be describing lobbyists who never crossed the line at all, 
um, and yet are producing all of the problems you're talking about. So it's not criminals right. here that, no. that you think are at the source of this problem. The very few criminals uh, in this system, the your very point. few uh, Randy Cunninghams and Bill Jeffersons and Jack Abramoffs, uh, you know, I just, I just couldn't uh, care where the line was. I just wanted to win. And uh, so I just kept going. There aren't a lot of people like that. First of all, lobbyists are lazy too, for the most part. So mm -hmm. they weren't going to, you know, that, that keeps them from becoming criminals, mm -hmm. I guess, for better or for worse at times. But the problem that I've tried to focus people on is that it's not what's illegal that's the problem. It's what's that, what is legal that's the problem. Mm -hmm. The lines in the sand are so uh, ridiculously drawn. One would actually have to ask oneself, well, why do you even need to go over those lines if they're so mm -hmm. absurd? Mm -hmm. And that's a good question that I hope one day to answer to myself. But um, what's legal in this system is the problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where America's attention has got to be focused. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I want to do is outline the reforms you've described. Mm -hmm. And then I want to hire Jack Abramoff, the lobbyist, to war game those reforms. So imagine the reforms you described were enacted tomorrow. And now I want a really expert, and I want you to be on the legal side of this line this time, but I want a really expert lobbyist to help me figure out how I get around this reformed world. So the reforms you've described, um, key ones that I think are very interesting and important. Number one, um, you, need, you want to eliminate entirely any contribution by lo those lobbying the government or participating in federal contracts or otherwise financially benefiting from federal from public funds. You don't want to limit it. You, you want, don't want to limit it. You want to eliminate it. Same thing with those who get perks from elected officials, whether it's a company or a union or association or a law firm. You shouldn't be able to give so much as one dollar, so zero. You can make a choice. You want to be a lobbyist then you can't give money. You want to give money, you can't be a lobbyist. Simple. Or you want to get money from the government, get money from the government, but you can't be giving uh, at the same time. Okay, that's, that's one important category. Next, you want to eliminate the revolving door. Um, should you choose to serve in Congress or on staff, this is very interesting, you should be barred for life from working for any company, organization, or association which lobbies the federal government. So do your time and go home. Um, uh, and number uh, three, you have a term limits proposal. You serve for three terms of two years and senators for two terms of six years. Uh, and number four, it's not clear how this relates, but it's fun. Repeal the 17th Amendment, um, which that's the amendment that made senators elected so that now we would have senators, I guess the original form was they were appointed by the legislature. Maybe a better system would be appointed by the governor, but whatever, repeal the 17th Amendment. All right, so that's now the reformed government. Also, all laws need to apply to congressmen. Any law oh, right, they right, make. Right, right, right. Yeah. That seems so obvious. I, I, yeah, <laughs> that's, of course. All laws need to apply universally to everybody. And right now, Congress exempts itself. That's one of the issues that's been raised by this insider trading. Right. Yeah, OK. So we have those reforms. Congress has now passed that. Overwhelmingly, the president has signed it. And now I hire you, Jack Abramoff to get my special interest legislation through the system. What do you do? Well, you're hiring the Jack Abramoff who's not going to break the law. Not, not going to break the law, okay. no, I right. insist. I just got to check which Jack Abramoff <laughs> yeah. you're hiring. The, uh, the, uh, our agency rents out different right. Jack Abramoffs for you. No. Um, the, uh, in other words, your question is, what, is a, what does a lobbyist do in a non-corrupt environment? Well, in this environment, in this I mean, the question is whether there's still corruption mm -hmm. possible. Well, I'm trying to get to what is the real problem here. Right? Well, uh, if, if money is removed from the system, so as a lobbyist, I have no ability to convey any money or any gratuity or anything that could cause gratitude on the part of the public servant toward me or my clients, okay? If that has happened... But you're not being creative enough, Jack. How I mean, so? All right, so you're right. You as the lobbyist can't come in and take credit. Right. But you can't tell me that Mike Scanlon and you couldn't put together a nice little operation which would effectively make it so that those rich people you otherwise would be lobbying for would be signaling in some careful way. No, no, no. Way. Those rich people couldn't give money either under what I propose. Nobody who gets a benefit that the rest of us don't get can give any money. So who are those six people in the United States who don't get some benefit from the federal government? Well, me. You, no, the, uh, no it's, uh, I get lots of benefits. You, no, 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 I don't no. mean benefit. When I say benefit, I don't mean Social Security checks. Okay. I'm talking about people go in for grants and contracts and things like Basically, they're getting special favors. They're, they are the special Okay, what about interest. Wall Street? 
Yes. Wall Street can't lie. Yes. They, those no. guys can't give any money no. either. No. Any corporation that has a relationship with the federal government or that is getting special attention from the federal government or is trying to achieve something the federal government is exempted from giving money, cannot give any money. So then I ask again, who can give money? Well, uh, farmers, they can't give money. People, people, out there, uh, people out there like I was before I was a lobbyist who believe in certain congressmen, who believe in certain causes that are general causes. You know, if, let's say I was pro-legalization uh, uh, of marijuana. Okay? Let's say. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, but, <laughs> well, I probably am. I don't know. After prison, I probably am. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Turn off these cameras. No, the, uh, <laughs> my children are watching. No. Um, let's use that as an example. All right. I, I want to have uh, Congress legalize marijuana. All right. Or I want to have Congress ban abortion, or I want to have Congress uh, do something in the general sense that applies to everybody doesn't apply to my company, doesn't apply to uh, my industry, doesn't create a financial incentive for me. Um, I, I, you know, I haven't drafted, by the way, the legislation, and nor am I going to, uh, of the legislation. I've of the just kinds hired of things. you. You've got yeah, Well, I was never a drafter. I had other people <laughs> do that. I was the knucklehead who uh, you know, thought of how to talk to people. But, um, uh, but it's, uh, the world that I'm, I'm trying to get to, and I think it's the world that, I, I, that you're trying to get to, and frankly, I think any reasonable person is getting to, is where, in essence, bribery is taken out of the system. Okay, but, but again, and, so mm -hmm. let's say Republicans want to cut the taxes right. of the very rich. Are the very rich not allowed to give money to the Republicans? Well, see, I would, I would say if somebody is trying to cut taxes across the board, that that's a general interest. Across C the board? Cutting, yeah, sure, cutting taxes. Okay. Now, if the wealthy are also getting a tax cut there, I still, I hold that's a general interest. We're going to disagree on certain of these things, because you're going to see in some things that I think special interests, I'm going to see in certain things special interests that you want. I guess, and again, I don't have, uh, it's hard for me to, to drill into the details of this, because I didn't, I, I didn't create my book in that way, and, and I should just maybe uh, mention that how I came up with these things, uh, these sort of bizarre, uh, you know, kind of suggestions that are the opposite of what I used to be. I came up with them walking the uh, walking track in prison uh, while I started thinking, you know, what if I were still a lobbyist? What are the kind of reforms that I, would I try to stop? What would I try to stop? Because the kind of reforms that they have now, you know what a reform is in, in Congress? I'll give you an idea. You, you can't buy a congressman a meal, all right, if they sit down and they use a fork and a knife and they eat on a plate. That's a meal. You can't buy them that. But if they stand up and they use their fingers, that they can do. They consider that a reform. Mm -hmm. Okay, another reform. Uh, you can't buy somebody a $25 uh, steak, or I guess in DC a hamburger, probably $25 <laughs> hamburger. Uh, you can't buy them a hamburger. I can't, if you're a congressman, I can't go to lunch and have a hamburger with you in $25. But if I declare our lunch a fundraising event, and I pull out of my, my jacket, five $5,000 checks from PACs and hand it to you and say, hey, we're having a fundraising event, here you go, that's completely legal. In their minds, that's reform. So I was thinking, what are the kind of things I would, I would go out of my way to stop where I still a lobbyist? And that's where I came to for this stuff. But so putting aside the, the details of it for now, I mean, obviously, they're, they're, as you drill into these things, that's where they become difficult. All right, and there's, and, but there are plenty of great minds that can do it. I'm not one of them, but there are plenty of great minds who can with the will. If I were in a system where money was removed, where I couldn't give money, I couldn't buy them lunch, I couldn't take them to see the Washington Redskins, although I'm not sure that was ever a benefit to anybody to see the Redskins, but uh, you know, I couldn't take them to the football game, and I couldn't take them out to play golf, and I couldn't put them on an airplane travel. I couldn't do anything except what anybody could do if they walked in. At that point, all of my discussion becomes on the merits politically and philosophically for them. Okay, so I, I have no disagreement about the effectiveness of that kind of narrow question about what lobbyists need to be allowed to gift or mm -hmm. not gift or give, and even the idea of taking lobbyists out of the business of giving money. Um, Charles Fried, on behalf of the ABA, um, lobbying committee came up with a proposal which was essentially the same here, which said that lobbyists should just not be in the business of raising money for people they are lobbying. So that's, that much is, uh, is fine. But I guess the question is whether that alone is enough. And the way you've made it more than that is you've, uh, it feels like you've opened this morass of trying to decide 
when I'm allowed to be giving, depending on whether the issue is really special interest to me or a general interest. So right. if, it's a raise, if it's taxing carried interest at the same rate that other uh, capital uh, uh, gains are, are ta I mean, rate, same income rate as opposed to a cap capital mm -hmm. gains rate, is that a special interest or is that a general interest? So it's, it seems like it's a morass, and I just wonder whether an alternative and you know, you know where I'm going here because you've read the book, the alternative of thinking about a more creative funding system for elections wouldn't be as effective without being so restrictive on the freedom of people to participate mm -hmm. in the political process. Because mm -hmm. you, you know, here you are, Jack Abramoff, the libertarian, telling all sorts of people they're not allowed to participate in the political process right. because they have a special interest here. Right. But the alternative would be, what if we funded you know, elections with small contributions. Um, you know, my system, the Fair Elections Now Act system says basically uh, you opt into a system where you get $100 from a citizen that's matched four to one by the government. I have a proposal of, you know, I'll rebate you $50 of your taxes. You can use that as a voucher to give to people who only take the voucher plus $100. But it would be a system where all of the funding comes from small dollars. Mm -hmm. In that system, would we have to worry about whether the particular benefit that I might get from the government is a special interest mm -hmm. or not? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm open to that. I'm, uh, but You're I'm, open to that? Yeah, I mean, right, I'm, that's I'm open That's all we're to... finished now. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll uh, consider it. No, the, uh, no I, I, I think anything that gets the money out of the system, mm -hmm. anything that removes the bribes, basically, is, is worth, uh, worth considering. You know, there, there are philosophical issues of not as much with your thing, but people who are in favor of public financing of campaigns and things like that. But uh, I think that the essential message that I'm trying to put forward is to stop the corruption, you've got to remove the money. Uh, because that's what I used when I was being corrupt, when right. I was doing that thing. Right. So that is what does it. Okay. And uh, so that's, that's the deal. Okay. Well, thank you. So okay. we'd like to now um, invite people to um, participate through questions. And our strategy for questions is in all of our events, and we're going to adopt this rule here too, is that I will control the queue. We have two mics that go around, and so you signal to me that you want to be on the queue, and I will signal back to you that I see that you're on the queue, and you'll get the mic and then you'll speak. And the mic will be delivered while the other question's being asked. Um, so why don't we start here with Dennis? Uh, Dennis Thompson. I once, several years ago, wrote a book called Ethics in Congress, which obviously had a, an enormous uh, impact on Washington. <laughs> My favorite book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now, Saw the movie, too. <laughs> we're waiting for the movie. Kevin <laughs> Spacey was otherwise occupied. Okay, okay. Uh, the, uh, I, I guess the, I, this goes to something that uh, uh, Larry was touching on, uh, why should we pay attention to somebody who's convicted uh, of a crime that has actually nothing much to do with the reforms that he's proposing? Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, we don't ask Barry Bonds about how to make baseball better. The, uh, we might ask him about how to avoid the temptations of cheating and violating the law. And we might ask a lobbyist like you how to actually get reforms through. Larry was hiring you, and instead he ended up lobbying you for his proposal. <laughs> uh, but you didn't answer that. Uh, what you did was, uh, in the book and tonight, list half a dozen uh, proposals which uh, I'm not sure you're in the best position to uh, suggest. I mean, I want to know what's the connection between your recommendations and your experience. And one recommendation that uh, Larry didn't mention and you didn't mention is a major one in the book is that we should have a smaller government. Uh, well, that sounds like the plank of a political party uh, and I'm not sure, again, how that follows exactly from your own experience. So could you tell us why uh, your experience really has anything to do with the reforms that you're actually proposing? I appreciate your question. That I've been probably in 200 interviews since uh, I got out of prison. That's the first time anybody asked that like that. So I appreciate you doing so. 
Look, I was in the middle of that world. Uh, and um, in terms of uh, people ask me, how do we know you're sincere? How do we know you're, uh, uh, you're telling us the truth? My response is, I'm not sure that it's important whether you know I'm sincere or not. I'm not here to run for president. I'm not here to win a popularity contest. I don't think with my, my name uh, brand, I'm gonna win any popularity contest anytime in the next uh, century or so. Uh, but I do have experience, deep experience in this world, and I've been in rooms that a lot of people haven't been in, and I know what that world hates. And so once I had the benefit of a two by four cracking me in the head uh, and came a little bit to my senses in terms of the damage this world does, uh, I, I'm somebody who I think has something to say about it in the sense that I've been there. Now, in terms of um, the smaller government part of it, uh, there are 30,000 lobbyists, or whatever the number is, it seems every day it's different, 20,000, 30,000. There, let's say it's 20,000 lobbyists walking around Washington, not because the government is the size it was in 1912. It's because the government is the size it is in 2011. And if one of the frustrations that people have is that there's just too many people lobbying, there are too many special interests, I would posit, and I don't think it's, uh, I don't know how one argues, that one of the reasons this is the case is because the government's involved in a lot of things. And so when I say that the government needs to get out of a lot of this stuff, sure, I personally believe in having a smaller government. I am not big on government to begin with. I had to go live with the government for about uh, three and a half years. It wasn't fun. Uh, and I, I believe, though, that that is consistent with wanting to get rid of the special interests, get the government out of some of this stuff, or devolve it to other places. What lobbyists want, by the way, and what I wanted, uh, to some degree, when I was in there, is you want power concentrated. If you could have it, you would have one person making every decision, and then you just go lobby that person, and you make sure that that person's in your pocket. The more diffuse power is, the more difficult it is for lobbyists, and that's, that's basically why I think that's important. Right here. <clears throat> Only I could move. Anyway, can you hear me? I can hear yes. you. My name is Erwin Shapiro, and I haven't written any book of relevance. <laughs> I've written book, but it's too technical to discuss. I have two questions, one very specific and one more general. The last, the second of which you may have covered in your book, which I confess I haven't read. The first question is, seems to me there are three functions of a lobbyist, three weapons the lobbyist has. One is the bribe, two is the threat, and three is the fig leaf. What do I mean by the third? I mean giving the representative, senator, or whatever, an excuse or a rationale to do the unreasonable, mm. to, to pretend to be in favor of a certain bill because of some reason which is probably not valid. Do lobbying firms have special teams which, uh, whose sole job is to develop the fig leaf or develop the cover story or what? Or is it just generic in any lobbying firm? It's genetic in every lobbyist. Uh, I mean, it, it is, that's what lobbyists do. You want to give political cover to whoever you're asking a favor from. You want to make sure that they have the political cover necessary to get away with it, basically to do it with a straight face and to be able to explain it. And it's uh, even, even something that's reasonable and good and wonderful that always becomes part of the discussion with, with congressmen and with their staff. How can we do this in our district? We would constantly have, uh, you know, my view was 435 congressmen, they all represent the entire country because they're all sitting on different uh, committees that have things to do with. So to me, it was nothing to go to a congressman from Ohio to help me out for something in Florida or something in Texas, as I did, in fact. Unfortunately, he also went to prison uh, for this. <laughs> you know, um, and, uh, but, but lobbyists don't view it uh, that congressmen are just from their district. They're for everything. And so then one needs to craft, and lobbyists do, uh, reasons why this is defensible at home with the, if you get asked. So it is part of every lobbying effort. How would you foresee reforms like you suggested actually come into being? Have you got any master plan? Well, I didn't know that was important. Wait a minute. The, uh, no, no it, it's, it's going to be difficult. Let's not kid ourselves. Uh, you're asking the very people who benefit 
from this lifestyle to get rid of this lifestyle. And ultimately, it's going to be a question of the media uh, shining uh, daylight on this stuff and exposing it like what 60 Minutes did with the insider trading scandal. I don't know how many people saw this, but uh, until they did do that, nobody was thinking about that. Uh, you know, we kind of, when I was a lobbyist, we kind of heard about members and staff. I, I own some restaurants, and they would come in sometimes and say, hey, you know, I just made a killing in, uh, you know, uh, defense or something like that. You know, we're going to have, there's going to be a big bill, and I just bought a bunch of stock. Frankly, I thought they were knuckleheads, uh, buying uh, 100 shares or something and making $200. Uh, who cares? You know, it didn't dawn on me, really. I, I didn't focus on the, what they were saying to me, which was they were insider trading, legally, legally. So, but until the media starts talking about it, nobody's doing anything. Now, the bill went from six sponsors, I think, to 50-something sponsors in a couple weeks. So if the American people, if the media continue to focus on this space, and there is more and more focus. And by the way, this is probably what uh, accounts for the fact that Congress has an approval rating of under 10%. People look at the Congress, and they look at the government, <coughs> and they think, you guys are a bunch of jerks. You know, you're a bunch of uh, blowhards who are getting rich on, uh, on our dime, usually, and uh, it's not fair, and so they ignore the system, or they get angry about the system, or they get out and occupy something, or they get out and have a tea party uh, and go organize an election. But the more that that happens on the left, and on the right, and in the middle, the more likely it is, I think, that something might happen. Right here. Uh, Egon Chalakian. I, um, while at Harvard Law School in the 70s, early 70s, I hooked up with a gentleman by the name of Stanley Surrey. Uh, he, and, he was a professor here. He, at that time, introduced me to Wilbur Mills and Russell Wong. I became a tax analyst on Capitol Hill in the joint committees. Years later, I ended up sitting on a board of directors in Los Angeles, Beneficial Standard Corporation, with Alfred Bloomingdale. Spent a lot of time with that clan, ended up on Reagan's kitchen cabinet. Knowing the players as I do in my memory at this point in time, did they have much of an impact on you? You came from that same neck of the woods, I, I gather. That's a, that's a culture by itself yeah. that has yeah. not been discussed tonight, but to, to ignore that culture, that right. was unique. It, it, it didn't. My father was president of Diners Club franchises when Bloomingdale was chairman, and I met Bloomingdale a couple of times, but I, I don't think he had a, a big influence on me, and frankly, I didn't meet any of the other Kitchen Cabinet guys until sort of the end of their lives when they were trying to, in the second term when I headed President Reagan's lobby, uh, I met a few of them, but it didn't really impact me. What frankly shaped me more than anything was my experience at Brandeis uh, University, uh, you know, the uh, bastion of right-wing uh, political activism. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> right here. Thank you, Mr. Abramov. Um, I imagine I, it was... I'm sorry, you should introduce yourself. Oh, James Williamson. Um, I imagine it was fun to meet Alex Gibney uh, as well, by the way. Um, here in Massachusetts, you mentioned uh, lobby, just once you mentioned lobbying at the state level. And of course, here in Massachusetts, we really don't have any problem with corruption there, except the occasional Speaker of the House. Um, I, because of your background in lobbying around gambling, I'd be very interested to hear if you have any insights into recently legislation was passed and signed in Massachusetts to authorize gambling. And there was some opposition to it, but it was uh, uh, roundly defeated. Um, what should we have been looking for in the lobbying process uh, in the, in, here in Massachusetts? And what should we be looking for? What should we be alert to in the ongoing decisions that are going to be made about where the gambling is going to take place and who's going to get to profit from it? Um, and how would we go about getting that information? Well. Um, gambling is all political, of course. Everything about the gambling industry is politics. And um, I spent a lot of my time stopping gambling when it was uh, in the interest of my clients, who were casinos, uh, to not have competition. And stopping, I don't know what happened here, to be honest with you, I, I haven't followed it, and I'm not even certain exactly what has transpired, but. Stopping gambling is easier uh, than getting something through. So the fact that they got it through uh, is remarkable. Uh, it generally doesn't happen. Um, so I'm sure there was a lot of money involved, obviously. Uh, these campaigns are not cheap. Um, in terms of uh, going forward, what do you need to be watching for? Uh, I think that 
probably uh, to the degree you can, you want to try to get some legislation through, if it's doable, to prohibit anybody in that industry from giving any money politically or they will own your state. Uh, they did this in New Jersey and they kept uh, the casinos for years uh, without having any real political power in the state other than as an employer. Um, so to the degree that it's possible, if I were at this point trying to do something to control it, I would try to prohibit them from giving any money politically at any level because even at the local level, um, giving to mayoral races and things like that, uh, these companies can have a tremendous impact. And don't forget how much cash gets kicked out by a casino. And I don't know if we're talking about one casino or a bunch of three casinos in the Boston area or? In three, three different regions around the state, if yeah. I've got it. They're probably going to be very lucrative and they're probably going to have a lot, some success, you know. And where, if they're smart from the other side, uh, if I were the casino, what I would do is use my money to consolidate the political control so that, number one, it could never be undone, and number two, when I wanted to expand, I would do it, and number three, um, maybe the most important, is to make sure there aren't four casinos. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, we had a question right here. Um, so I'm Matt Bieber uh, from the Divinity School. Um, can you, I haven't read the book, so could you talk a little bit about the, the conversion process, the sort of personal, reflective, you know, self-inquiry kind of driven uh, re uh, conversion process that you've gone through to, to sort of get to a place where you saw what you've done before is, is, is not so savory. And could you also say a word or two about um, what it's like to, to, to sort of be the, the object of so much shame and derision and, and whether you hope that and what your hopes are for, for whether that reputation will change over the course of your life? Well, um, I, w I would love to say that I, in the middle of my lobbying career, while I was making you know, boatloads of money, that it hit me all of a sudden that I shouldn't have been in that business. But I can't say that. It only hit me after I was out of that business. And um, I guess uh, I'm maybe the kind of person who needed to have uh, the entire house cave in on them before they realized that they were living in a uh, house of cards. And, but that's what happened. And so with me, um, my um, uh, end came rather suddenly. Within a period of a couple months, I went from everything was great to nothing was, was there. Everything was obliterated. And it probably took that uh, and then, by the way, and then it was two more years before I went to prison. So for two years, I sat um, and basically uh, tried to work through what was going on and where, what did I, what did I do? You know, well, first I had to ask myself, because you know, when it started, I did have to be honest with you, I thought, what are they talking about? I didn't do anything wrong. I just did what everybody else does. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't innovate any of this. I just did more of it. Okay. So I had uh, 72 seats at the Redskins Stadium, which unfortunately is what I had, uh, as opposed to four. Okay. So what's the difference? That's the first thoughts I had. Well, I should say, that's not even the first thought. The first thought I had was, this will blow over. Man, it's a little bump in the road. Won't be any problem. And uh, when the first Washington Post article came out, and the article, the essence of the article was that I charge a lot of money to my clients. That was no different than articles that had been on the front page of the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal about me that I put on our firm's website, all right, as advertising. So I, I, I look back now and, you know, it's kind of uh, morbid, but the email exchange between my firm and me after the first article was, should we put this up on the website? You know, is the picture okay? You know, that kind of stupidity. We were just absolutely in a different universe. So at first I thought it would go away and then it became clear it wasn't going away and it was a um, uh, basically I was in denial. I, what did I do wrong? Uh, what's this all about? That didn't last long by the way because very quickly uh, I was able to somehow objectively sit down and get outside of myself and look at what I was and look at what I was doing and I don't want to say everything I did was wrong. It wasn't. First of all, certainly most of what I did was legal, but put that aside for a second. Most of what I did in life, I don't think was wrong or bad, but I was involved in areas that were bad. 
And it was those areas, and those were in areas, by the way, I went to prison for. You know, I mean, things that I did go to prison for, I was wrong about. And I regret, and I regret all of this, of course. Uh, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't a matter of my saying, all right, well, let me look at exactly, legally, what did I do wrong? What are the precise things? I'm going to be sorry about that and everything else to hell with you all. I didn't take that approach. I took the approach of let me look at what morally I should have been doing. You know, the things I had studied my whole life that I somehow separated. You know, I separated my religious and philosophical beliefs from my activities. And I'm not the first person to do that, obviously. Many people do that. But the fact that I did it, uh, and I, when I woke up to it, it was dreadful. And it was horrific to me. And it was depressing. And I was in depression. You know, and uh, there would be mornings when I, I never thought I wanted to kill myself, but, but I thought, gee, wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been better if I wasn't ever here? And that's a horrible feeling. But I have a family. I have five kids and a wife who are also suffering, and my mother and my father. My mother passed away, unfortunately, you know, through this. And so it was a horrific process, but it was a necessary process. And so by the time I got to prison, I had already reconstructed my belief system. I hadn't been able to speak about it because, first of all, the media weren't really interested in hearing me, to be honest with you. Um, I became a cartoon. Uh, I put on a rain hat because it was raining one day when I went to go plea. I went to go to the uh, courtroom, uh, you know, give you an idea what it's like for somebody who was in my circumstance. The media camp outside your house, you know, they accost your family, uh, wherever you go, they, they rush you. And the paparazzi in the media, and I call them paparazzi, the camera people, they're not like decent journalists, you know, that uh, Tom Brokaw and things like that. They're nasty. And what they want is for you to look at them because they want to get a picture of you looking at them. So they'll scream stuff at you that's unimaginable. Or they'll, they'll accost you physically. They'll make you walk into them. And eventually, by the way, I mean, I'm you know, not uh, as strong as I used to be, but I'm not completely weak. Finally, I just started walking right into them and knocking them over. You know, they were in the way. I didn't care. But that's kind of the sort of weird, horrible situation. And, and I became a cartoon. So I came out of, I went to court. I wanted to avoid them when I was going to court. That was the big day for me to plea. And it was January. It was a uh, January uh, 4th or something. 6th. 6th uh, in, in D.C. And um, it was cold. It was raining. I got up early. I, I left my house in the dark. I wanted to get to court way before, hours before my court appointment time because I wanted to beat the media in there. It was raining. So I grabbed the hat. You know, and look, I'm an Orthodox Jew. We have hats. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's just sort of the deal. And uh, so I put on this hat and I put on this raincoat, and I left. And my wife was sleeping. She normally would look at me and say, "What are you? What are you nuts? What are you wearing? You look like Boris Badenov or something like that." You know, but she was sleeping. And I went out and I walked in and I got in with none of the media there. And I had some other things on my mind that day. I was pleading guilty to to crimes and going to face the fact that I would be taken away from my family. So I, we finished, and uh, I was with the Justice Department and the FBI guys who, by the way, treated me very fairly and very appropriately, never abused me in any way. You know, I know that that happens, but they didn't to me. Um, and I put my hat on and my coat on to leave, thinking, all right, we're done. And I walk out, and the media starts screaming at me. You know, are you a gangster? Are you a mafia guy? And I'm looking, who are they talking to? Mafia guy, no mobster dresses like this since George Raft. I mean, you know, mobsters dressed like Tony Soprano. Who are they talking about? And uh, it was me. And uh, so I kind of, you know, oh, my God, I shouldn't have worn my hat and coat, I guess. And I became a cartoon. And so I couldn't talk to the media. I couldn't talk to anybody. But before I got to prison, this is what I was thinking. I was thinking, you know, I'm part of a system, and I'm, I'm probably the, the razor's edge of a system that's destructive and really is against everything I'd always thought about for our country. And whether it was greed or whether it was just power or whether it was wanting to win or whatever it was, I shouldn't have been there. I shouldn't have been doing that. And I'm about to get punished, I know, before I went to prison. I, I knew I was going to prison. And when I went to prison, I didn't know how long I'd be in prison. And it wasn't until I was there 22 months that I even got my sentence. So I hope nobody in this room has been to prison. Prison's horrible. But every night in prison is terrible. But to be there and not know when you're leaving prison is indescribable. 
So finally I got sentenced and I got more time than the Justice Department had even asked for. Okay, that's fine. And I went back and did my sentence. But when I was there and after that is when I started really thinking. And I started thinking, okay, it's not enough that I know I'm wrong. It's not enough that I, you know, okay, I'm never going to do that again. Obviously, I'm not going to do that again. Who's going to hire me as a lobbyist? Can you imagine that meeting on Capitol Hill? I did. Hill? I just did. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman Jack Abramoff's here to see you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it's not going to happen. So, um, so I have, I figure I got to go do something else, and I don't want to stick my head out and become public. To be honest with you, it's not. It doesn't feel good to hear things about yourself, like they said about me. And, um, and they still say, you know, but uh, I guess you get some thick skin, but you really never get that thick of skin. And um, so I decided, you know, this isn't what I should be doing. I shouldn't be hiding. I shouldn't go away. I should come back and try to do something about what I was doing. And uh, in my head, I have experiences of that world that are unlike a lot of the people in our country. And most of the people who know what I know aren't going to talk about it because they're earning money with it right now, even tonight. And so I decided to go back in. And I've been attacked pretty severely, by the way, by my former world, not that I frankly care. Um, but there are a lot of people who don't want to hear what I have to say, not for the reasons that they think, oh, you're a criminal and you're a felon who wants to hear from you. Okay, that I understand. You know, people have that view. I, I understand that. But from the point of view of shut up, Abramoff, go away and die. You know, get out, get out of here. You're ruining it for the rest of us. Well, I don't consider myself part of that rest of us anymore. I consider myself part of the rest of us. So, anyway. Sorry for the long answer. We have a question over here. Yeah, Jay Livingston. Uh, probably the most pernicious special interest lobby in Washington, ironically enough, is the one that's uh, probably closest to your own heart, which is the Israel lobby. Uh, your own capital athletic fund uh, funneled $140,000 uh, to illegal settlers' uh, militia for equipment and sniper training, uh, even though it wasn't a, a charity that uh, performed what it had stated that it was going to do. You recently also expressed great uh, undying gratitude to your friend Tom DeLay for his uh, defense of Israel throughout his many years. Uh, why is it uh, convicted felons and unscrupulous people like you and DeLay feel so close to the outlaw state of Israel? Is it that uh, birds of a feather flock together? Well, I don't know. I like Ireland, too. I don't know if that counts, but uh, I like Ireland, too. But a lot of countries I like, but uh, I don't know how to answer you. Obviously, uh, we don't agree on Israel. We don't agree on Israel. What can I tell you? Uh, look, I went to jail for, uh, for misusing uh, uh, nonprofit money, and I'm sorry I did do it. Uh, but I'm an unabashed supporter of Israel, and there's... Well, they weren't, they weren't, settl they weren't settlers, but, you know, it's not... Uh, we're going to have to agree to disagree. Okay. okay. Right here. Hi, I'm Tom Ferguson. I was actually on NPR with you a couple of weeks ago on the uh, program on insider trading. I teach at UMass Boston. Um, I just want to ask you about the analytics of this. I mean, it's a very interesting discussion, but a lot of folks who've tried to understand the logic of lobbying have had trouble trying to trace it through when they think about exactly how does a congressman or woman price the services they're doing. I ask because when you look at sort of what's paid and for what they get, and you get some odd cases like maybe you, you might sell I'm going to make it up, 6% of the defense budget one night for $200,000, and then a week later, somebody will contribute a million dollars and get just a gambling resort or something like that. I mean, could you shed some light on the, the process under what you might call the, I know you're a libertarian, so you must, in the tradition of libertarianism in the United States, they love the price system. You must understand what my question's point is. I'd be quite grateful for any insight you could shed on that. Well, I, I don't think there's a rational answer to the question. It's a good question. Um, but I, my experience is that those members of Congress, which was most of them, uh, who are into uh, raising money and trying to um, not necessarily do what they would consider to be an illegal quid pro quo, but in essence a quid pro quo, um, they are, uh, they're just trying to get as much money for anything they do, no matter what it is. And uh, so if a million dollars is available, they're going to try to get a million dollars. If $100,000 is available, they're going to try to do that. So I'm, I'm not certain that if I understood the question correctly, but uh, I don't know that there's a necessarily a rationale here. It's, it's more of a um, Congress 
fears not being reelected and not getting, uh, not advancing in the system and not being able to become a committee chair person. And so money is the oil that makes that engine go and they're gonna try to get whatever they can get. So I don't know that there's necessarily a pricing system. There wasn't with us, I mean, so I, I, I'm unaware. But of let, let me push a little bit more on the question. Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. It's been, you know, it's one of the puzzles at the center of whether money is actually corrupting the system. And, and one form of it is the price is so low. You know, you, you in, your, right. in your book talk about the, you know, the return on investment right. that you got from lobbying. You know, you said your clients, you got them you know, 80,000, I can't remember the number, some huge percentage return right. on investment. Um, and the economists would say, well, how is that possible? Why doesn't the system just bid the price up so that the return is something like a market return? Like, why, why is it so irrational? Why, why, do they, why doesn't the government hold out for more, right, so that they demand, you know, that I get, if I'm going to get a billion dollar subsidy, which the sugar people get because of the tariffs, a billion dollar subsidy, you should have to pay, you lobbyists, more than just, you know, a million dollars for that. You should be paying right. half a billion dollars for that billion dollar subsidy. Why doesn't it work like that? Because they're dealing in stolen goods. Stolen goods. Yeah, I mean, in essence, this isn't a normal business. They're dealing in stolen goods. They're taking things out of the public trust and selling them. So you're not going to get a lot of uh, Duke Cunningham's with a uh, price chart. Too bad. There are these guys, yeah. <laughs> okay, Abby? Hi, I'm Abby Brown. I'm a, a fellow at the center. I'm wondering if you can walk us through, presumably there are some idealists who get elected to Congress still who go there with some public interest in mind. Um, can you walk us through how you go about corrupting them? What's, how do, what's, the, what's the rhetoric of that conversation? How, how, how do you reel them in and so mm -hmm. forth? Um, when a member of Congress, a new member of Congress shows up in Washington these days, the first thing they meet is not the lobbyists. They meet their leadership. And their leadership introduces them to the lobbyists in the following way. They say that uh, you're a new member of Congress, and the most important thing for you is to get reelected next time. Because if we lose your seat, then we're going to have to fight and get it back the time after that. So since that's the most important thing, and since most of them, 80% of them, come with debt, the first thing we're going to have you do is you've got to retire your debt. And now we're talking about before the Congress is even convened. We're talking about in December after the November election. And here's a group of people who are very good at helping you retire your debt. Meet the lobbyists. And that's where it starts. And even if they're the best folks in the world and they have the, most, uh, the greatest aims, and by the way, some of them will say, look, I have just no interest. I'm not gonna take any lobbyist money. I'm not gonna get involved in that the first year. And maybe in the second year. But when they're there 20 years, uh, even if they think they're, you know, I'm taking the campaign contribution, I'm going to take that $2,000, but I don't sell my vote for $2,000. They're wrong. They sell their vote for a glass of water. Not consciously, but they're human beings. And if somebody does something for you, and you're a decent person, what is the thing you're going to think in your mind? Gee, that person did something nice for me. Now, you can either be a jerk and just say, I hate them, so... If you do something nice for me, I hate you. And a lot of parents complain that sometimes kids act like that. Uh, but, uh, uh, or you can be a decent person. Well, gee, uh, I, I can't give them with that, but I'm going to root for them. Or I can't uh, do that, but maybe I could do this. That's how it starts. It is not a moment where uh, somebody walks into Bob Nay and gives them $50,000 in casino chips. That is very rare. What I just described to you is virtually everybody. And it's just a matter of time before they are beholden to the lobbyists at one level or another. David. Uh, Mr. Abramwell, thank you very much for being here. My name is David Korn. I'm a professor of pathology at the medical school, the Harvard Medical School. Um, th there's probably a lot of agreement in this room, certainly, that the root of evil is the money, right? That's what you're saying. But if a miracle were to happen, and there was legislation passed, as some have been trying to do for a very long time, to make the system a publicly funded system and get rid of uh, um, some of the temptation. 
Don't you think that the Supreme Court would rule it a First Amendment violation and overturn the legislation? In other words, there's, there seems to be a hopelessness mm -hmm. about the uh, route, road to a solution for a problem that a cause of which is very generally understood and accepted. How do you get rid of it? Well, there's an interesting case in North Carolina right now that just uh, the Fourth Circuit has affirmed, uh, which bans lobbyist contributions in North Carolina. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see where that goes. But somebody who chooses path A, you know, the rights aren't taken away. They're making a choice to engage in lobbying or engage in getting money out of the public till or whatever they're doing. For them to forego a an, an right, we do have that, you know, in society. And it seems that that case in North Carolina may wind up being a real, a seminal case in this regard. And it does bring hope that, obviously, if the Supreme Court knocks it down or says that that's not going to work, we're going to have to go back and look at other remedies. There are ways around the Supreme Court, too. Okay, they're difficult. They're constitutional amendments. And they're very, very, they're impossible. When's the last time the Constitution was amended? I would venture to say most of the people in the room weren't born yet. So um, it's a difficult process, but I, I think that there is an opening here to, to go after it. We'll see what happens. But David was asking about public funding, which you, mm -hmm. for a moment, opened your eyes to, but then now you've, you've shut this down again. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm and again, I, and I'm, I want to push you a little bit more yeah. on this, because, yeah. because again, what you're talking about is limits, mm -hmm. ways to limit people from mm -hmm. participating. And you can't really, in the heart of your heart of hearts, believe. I mean, you might have a very accurate political judgment about the likelihood of public funding. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't, in your heart of hearts, really believe that if all we do is limit, the wealthiest 1% won't just find another way around the system to exert their influence inside the system, right? So well, I, look, first of all, if, if things are drawn tightly, I can tell you I sat in prison with a bunch of guys who tried to work their way around the system, okay? And they were convicted and prosecuted and th thrown in prison. So I don't want, you know, if you've been to prison, you don't want anybody to ever go to prison. And I don't want to see people in prison. But if that's the penalty for playing games, you're going to get rid of a lot of there too. But let me tell you why I'm against public funding, among other reasons. First of all, I, I uh, you know, I'm, I am a conservative. I am a libertarian type conservative. So, who any, wants to silence a bunch of speakers? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I want to, I want to silence if they make a choice. I'm giving them the choice. Nobody's forcing anybody to be a lobbyist. I wasn't forced to be a lobbyist, you know, <laughs> and uh, if people make a choice, I think that they, like in all things in life, you give up certain things if you choose other things. But in terms of um, public funding, look, I have a distrust of the government. I have to be honest with you, and not needless to say, I have a distrust of the government after what I've been through just in the last uh, period of time. You know, they say that a, um, a, a conservative is a liberal who is mugged. Well, a libertarian is a conservative who was indicted. Okay, and um, so I, you know, I lived in complete government control, so maybe that does influence my thinking a little more than others. I don't, and I'm not trying to disparage everybody who works for the government, surely not, but generally I don't like the idea of putting in the hands of people power to make decisions. Right, okay, the but, but then vouchers don't do that, Okay, right? yeah, I said the voucher thing, actually I was right. much more open to in terms right. of from my own philosophical okay you know, point of view. When I read your book, uh, I, I thought that was a much more, the, the Grant and uh, right. Franklin, uh, Franklin uh, approach, that would be something much more, I'd be personally as a conservative much more amenable to. And I think it's very important, we talked briefly before, to get this stuff fixed, we're going to have to find something that people on the right and people on the left are going to be able to agree to uh, and to overcome the kind of bitter political divide that's, that's in this country. It's something that both sides can get a hold of. And I, I think that might, that might be one way to do it. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm Jeff Bridges. I'm a student at the Divinity School. Um, before I was there, though, I worked in politics for about 10 years. And um, it really just completely sucked my soul dry. And um, I think you understand. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so coming here and, and going to Divinity School, and I got involved with Occupy Harvard, and it's really been a, a redemptive experience for me. 
And I came here tonight thinking, oh, this is Jack Abramoff. He's writing a book to make money, and now he's trying to sell it to Harvard students. Naturally, that's just what the guy's doing. That's what you do. You write a book. Something bad happens, you write a book. Um, but then when you were talking about your experience of being arrested and reflecting on how you, you, you operated um, um, as a lobbyist, it, it really spoke to me, and I, I, I believe you. I buy it. I want to know why you're doing what you're doing right now. What, what do you hope to accomplish with the path you've chosen now? Well, I mean, as I said, what I want to do is I've got some role to play uh, in solving this problem. It's a problem. I've come to recognize it as a problem. Uh, I mean, you all recognize it intuitively. I'm ashamed that I didn't, okay, but I didn't. And not only didn't I recognize it, I was in it. And not only was I in it, I might have led it. All right, but okay, that was prelapsarian at this point. Um, and um, uh, so what I'm doing now uh, is, as, as hard as it is, by the way, it's not easy to sit here and say the things I'm saying to you all. I mean, you know, it, it's just not. Um, and you're not the only ones I'm saying it to. And I've said it in front of big TV audiences. Uh, and I probably, I got to believe in their heart of hearts, my family probably wishes I wouldn't say it although they've been nothing but encouraging <laughs> because they also see that this is not a system. Look, none of my kids, you know, I, I was very political. My wife worked for the Republican National Committee. We were both uh, political junkies. Not one of my children, well, one of my children uh, is joining the college Republicans, but uh, not one of my kids wants anything to do with American politics, uh, not just because of what happened to us, because they see that it's just utterly hopeless. They think it's utterly hopeless and wordless. So I think just even for them, um, I, I want to do something to try to move the ball forward. I'm not going to do it by myself. Uh, frankly, I wish I were back in the position. I wish I came to this while I was where I was. Uh, you know, when I sat in prison, um, you know, when you're in prison, all you're thinking about is, how do I get out of here? How do I get out of here? Even an hour earlier, just please, God, get me out of here. It's just impossible to describe what it's like. 24 hours a day, people screaming. Uh, you know, the, the, you, we lived six men to a 150 square foot space. Uh, it's just a, a nightmare. So you're thinking every minute, how do I get out of here? So what was I thinking? <laughs> of course, I was thinking, darn, why didn't I think of this when I was a lobbyist? I could have had the laws changed, all right, and figured some way to have gotten me out of here if this had happened. Well, obviously, that's silly. But I do often sit back and think, you know, what if I still was in that game? Boy, I could really do some damage if I was in there and, I, and it, it occurred to me what has occurred to me in a sense. Obviously, I'm not there and I can't. So what I can do is I can speak about it and I can tell people what went on and I wrote about it. And, you know, I, I have a book out. I have a $44 million restitution order. This book would have to outsell the Bible for me to, uh, <laughs> to see any, uh, you know, any money. And I didn't do it to make money. And the industry anyway, as everybody who writes books knows, you know, is, is in terrible shape. Uh, you know, people aren't making, unless you're you know, Rawlings or whoever, you're not making a lot of money. I did it because I think it's vital people know. And if they know, maybe they'll get angry. And if they get angry, maybe they'll do something. And maybe, maybe, this great country, and it is a great country, and a great people will rise up and try to get something changed. That's why I did it. So we have last question. So make uh, it really, really good. <laughs> a lot of pressure now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my name is Howard Melman. I just, you were saying before when telling, um, when your story broke, how you were in denial and you were just in a different world. And I immediately wondered, do you think that uh, politicians and staffers are equally in denial and in that different world? Yes, they're absolutely. Not only are they not recognizing what has been now become clear to me and has been clear to all of you from the beginning, uh, but think about folks who can go around trading on insider information and buying stock on the one hand, uh, and then reading the paper that Raj Rajaratnam gets sent away for 11 years, and they're doing exactly the same thing, if not worse, than he did. Uh, and they not only don't feel bad about it, they feel good about it. So, and, and they don't understand. And these same guys, and by the way, I do talk to congressmen still. They're quiet about it. Obviously, no congressman wants it in the paper. They're talking to me. Uh, but, uh, 
and they, and they, they don't get it. Why is it that we're so unpopular? Why is it that 9% approval rating? How is that possible that Obama has a better approval rating than we do? Are you kidding? Are you kidding? That's the world they live in. They don't live in, unfortunately, they totally um, disassociate themselves from a reality that everybody else intuitively sees. And by the way, as did I in those days. So I understand it, but I, and I feel bad for them in a certain respect. You know. So Jack Abramoff, thank you for coming to Harvard. <laughs>